I'm going to turn on your mic. Yep, hot. So let's start. Uh, I'm just going to jump right in. You've got uh, the bios of all the speakers. Uh, I'm going to start with, with, with you, Stephen. Oh, wow. <laughs> just uh, here we go. <laughs> I, I, I read on the internet. <laughs> well, it must be true. <laughs> where, where you stole the election and gave it to Biden in, in, in Maricopa County. Just, just, just between you and me, how'd you do it? Uh, it was difficult because we had to coordinate across 300 million Americans and we had to do it across many election administrators. We had to do it across the 15 counties in Arizona and of course each county has their own quirks and then we had to of course take that and replicate it in each of the 50 states and of course the real challenge for me doing this was that I wasn't in office <laughs> at the time. Um, that I was unseating the Democrat incumbent chief elections official, so that I'm particularly proud of. To, to be a little bit more serious. Okay. Uh, <laughs> reluctantly. <laughs> Who cares if there are conspiracy theories about the election in Maricopa County? What, what, what difference does it make? Uh, Joe Biden's in the White House, Arizona was called for Biden, uh, there's a lot of people who want to say uh, he stole the election, so what? Yeah. I think much of this conference is centered around the notion that there is an objective truth. And I think establishing that and fighting for that, which I think is an inherently conservative principle, is something that's worth fighting for even if there's nothing at stake. But there's also something that's inherently bad in witch hunts even if you don't burn any witches. Uh, someone in for the Washington Post wrote essentially that, so it's not my idea, trust me, but it was a good idea. And the notion is that just you're destabilizing the institution, you're destabilizing trust in the system by just raising all of these false conjectures and false threads. And so we felt it was necessary to respond to as many of those as possible. And we're not anti-audit, we're not anti-review, but we think it should be done in a professional manner. We think it should be done in a nonpartisan manner. We think it should be done by non-conspiracy theorists. We think it should be done by recognizable expert ma uh, processes. And unfortunately, much of what was done in the post-election context in Arizona was exactly the opposite. And I think it just offended me from uh, uh, almost a stance of competency. And so we, we've been trying to counter that because ultimately we want people to have confidence in this institution because as you and I discussed on the way down here, if you don't have confidence in this institution, it's just like not having confidence in the criminal justice system. Like why would you think that it's right for somebody to be prosecuted in the criminal justice system? Why would you think it's right for somebody to have the, the power conferred upon them by the United States government if you don't believe in this institution. And that's incredibly destabilizing and I think should be uh, worrisome to anyone, but especially to, you know, I'm an institutionalist conservative who likes to think about institutions, who likes to think about the legacy of Edmund Burke, and so it's especially worrying to me. Uh, Representative Underwood, I wanted to ask you, you, you have focused a lot on disinformation as it relates to uh, targets in the black and uh, black community and, and among people of color. Uh, what what is the nature of the problem there? Well, we've seen. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's good to be with all of you today. Um, we've seen a variety of ways that these communities of color have been targeted by either domestic um, actors or foreign actors, and it's had uh, a really a challenging impact. So the two examples that I'll raise are the 2016 election and the way that the Russians and foreign actors targeted uh, black voters uh, to spread their disinformation campaigns. And then what we saw in the early days of COVID and the information that was uh, directed towards 
the Black community to suggest that, you know, Black people had some kind of natural immunity to the virus um, and that there was no reason to be concerned or to take any kind of mitigating measures. And so I think that, you know, we know that uh, communities of color are very active online, um, can be pace setters and culture creators. We know all that um, in terms of setting internet culture, um, but we also know that uh, they that there may not be trusted vehicles from traditional news outlets, and people are more reliant on social media as their source of news. And so if there are um, either domestic or foreign actors that are pumping and targeting disinformation towards these communities. It's something that really poses a threat to not only the physical health and well-being of this population, but to our democracy at large. Is there a connection uh, between the COVID misinformation and the election misinformation? Are, are, are the same groups uh, putting out both sets of false messages? Well, over the course of the pandemic, um, I think that we have seen this group of people, meaning communities of color, be targeted. I can't necessarily tell you that, yes, it was, you know, the Russian IRA that did it, right? Like, that's not what I'm trying to, to say, and I don't want to mislead anyone to that end. But I do think that um, we know that the platforms are being continuing to be exploited to reach these communities, and we know that it's being done uh, very effectively. And so, you know, part of my work in the Congress has been um, to try to, you know, hold social media companies and platforms accountable while also making sure that there are um, effective protections um, on those platforms so that people can more easily understand and identify credible news sources or, or pieces of information. Sounds like a great dissertation prompt for a young University of Chicago student, though. <laughs> a BA thesis, the overlap between COVID and elections. Uh, and, uh, Stephen has also volunteered to be your thesis supervisor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I recommend you take him up on it. Uh, Chris, if you compare the election disinformation uh, in the 2016 cycle and the 2020 cycle, uh, what, what commonalities and differences did you see? It was frankly quite different, um, but in some senses it, it was, there was some overlap. Um, and to, I think to Congresswoman Underwood's point about the 2016 election and the, the COVID in, uh, overlap, I, I think in those, spaces, it's different actors. There may have been some commonalities, but what I'm finding really remarkable right now is the overlap between the 2020 Stop the Stealers, the election deniers of 2020, and those that are now amplifying some of the biolab and chem lab theories coming out of Ukraine that the Russians are, are pushing out. I mean, it's, it's almost a single circle uh, Venn diagram. And it is quite remarkable how the communities and the population shift their, their focus and their target. But you know, unpacking it again from 2016 by 2020, when you think about what the Russian, uh, the interference campaign in 2016, it was focused on three different uh, vectors. First was um, more the technical attacks on uh, election infrastructure, the election machines, the equipment that are at the county and local level. Um, the second is the campaigns against the, um, the actual political campaigns, the political candidates themselves to get in, to get sensitive data. And then the third is just this broader disinformation piece and you know, t questions about uh, the candidate, candidate Clinton's health and how they amplified some of those stories, uh, continuing to push hack and leak campaigns through proxies like uh, WikiLeaks and uh, Guccifer 2.0 which we, we actually saw some of those same sorts of methodologies repeating through 2020. Again, leaked information. Even there was a conversation last night about the, the Hunter Biden laptop. That was remarkably similar to a hack and leak operation from 2016. It was just in a different model. And again, whether it was Russia or not, I don't know, I don't care. The big shifts that I saw from 2016 to 2020 was the reaction across media and how they did not uncritically and breathlessly report these things. Perhaps they over-rotated, particularly with the way the, pro, the, the platforms learn. They may have learned a little too much. Um, but again, when it came down to 2020, the disinformation operations from foreign actors um, was nowhere near the level 
of, of 2016, at least from where I was sitting inside government. Ultimately, what it came down to was more of the domestic disinformation that was being pushed. Um, that was really that the field had been in the, the setting had been established in the summer of 2020 as COVID was moving through the country and state election and local election officials were shifting the way that they would conduct the election, including the increase in mail-in ballots. That was where the stage was set for a 2020 domestic disinformation campaign, that the mail-in ballots themselves and that entire system is wide open for fraud. And again, we even saw that last night from the Attorney General of Arizona. Yeah. Christine, what, what do you actually bring us up to speed on what the Attorney General uh, said and what you make of it? This was incredibly frustrating to me. As, as I just mentioned to Mr. Axelrod, I had a once in a lifetime opportunity to sit five feet away from the former president of the United States and really soak in every, you know, because whether or not you supported him, he was in the office of the presidency for eight years and what an incredibly rich experience and thoughtful individual whom I happen to not vote for, sorry. Um, but while all that was going on, unfortunately, the attorney general of Arizona, who was one of the first prominent Republicans in the state of Arizona to say, no, there wasn't any fraud. It's just people voted differently down ticket. Well, he's a candidate for United States Senate now. And so that's been walked back and walked back and walked back. And just as we finally thought we were out of the woods, he just cast new doubts. And he did it in sort of an artful way, which is we found fraud. Well, you know, you have to go down many pages to find that the fraud is the individual instance of one voter, and there was about, you know, fewer than 50 of those. And, you know, we allege some, you know, clerical maybe sloppiness, and, but it's, of course, headlined and captured by, you know, Maricopa County is intransigent, Maricopa County is obfuscating. And, of course, then he went on, uh, Steve Bannon, he of, uh, fled the zone with shit fame and said, we all know what happened to the 2020 election. And you know, this is, that's incredible because he, he very recklessly omits the tons of hours that we spent with his investigators debunking 99% of the things that this cyber ninjas group had presented and yet none of those were captured in his report. And this is all done under the trappings of, we wanna build election confidence, we wanna support election integrity, which is why we're going to tell you about the two things that we have question marks about and not the 150 things that make, should make you feel good about the system. And so it was, it was incredibly frustrating and he knows what he was doing and it's, it's in, insulting to the people I work with on a daily basis. It's an insulting to, again, the subjective notion of fact and uh, we're going to respond. And, you know, a lot of people say, uh, you know, maybe you should play it cool. You know, you, you're up in 24, you got to bounce. Ah, that's not really my style. <laughs> um, so damn the torpedoes and here we go. As, as some of you maybe saw, I was tweeting last night, unfortunately, a little bit during President Obama's speech. So this connects with uh, what Chris was just saying about the shift from uh, foreign to domestic origins of disinformation. Uh, I just sort of wonder whether you see a path back for the Republican Party uh, away from the disinformation of, of the uh, rigged election. I mean, you're, given there's a Republican on the panel. I mean, is there, is there, a, is there a future uh, in the Republican Party for, uh, for, for challenging? Yeah, I mean, What's the alternative? We lay down and we become one party believes in democracy and one party doesn't. I think that this is one of the things that APAC always had a right vision for, is they never wanted APAC to become a one party issue because they thought that's when you've lost when it becomes a one-party issue, because then if you're out of power, you have support for Israel. If you're in power, you, have, you don't have support, or vice versa. And so I, don't, I hope that is not the situation we're facing. Um, we did have someone in the front row who was seemingly very skeptical of that notion. I read the polling. I know some of the headwinds we're facing. But I will tell you, like I go to lunch at random places, and people will come up and say, I'm a Republican. Your lunch is on me. So I'm hoping that there is a silent, not necessarily, maybe it's not a majority, but a silent something that will still play a pivotal role in determining the, 
the, the future of our politics that has to be addressed, and we're gonna keep working with that group, and we're gonna keep doing it, not because the, whichever wins, way the political winds might be going, but because it's the right thing to do. I just wanna put on the record that a Republican and a graduate of the University of Chicago has just discovered a free lunch. Yes. <laughs> 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 I, I've gotten quite a few at this presentation, too, so. Congresswoman Underwood, what can Congress do, uh, and what can the executive branch do about uh, disinformation as a, as a threat of election subversion? Well, we, I think, have some pretty broad authority. I think the question right now is about uh, who has the courage to take action. And um, will we continue to um, create uh, some air cover, if you will, in the Congress for those executive branch leaders uh, for doing what will need to be done to ensure that we can have a democracy where the truth is recognized as true and that the American people um, can have confidence in their elections, the results, and that um, their votes you know, were counted um, as cast. And I think that, you know, because this is being perceived and continued to be um, spoken about in partisan terms, that gets to be really challenging. Um, and so I would just, I would just urge, you know, all of us to think about that prior question um, in terms of, you know, where do we go from here? Uh, it, it's not just up to a local election authority to, you know, continue to reaffirm that, you know, whatever happened in their jurisdiction was fine. If we have, you know, 40 percent or more of the country that just does not have faith in the process. Um, and, and so, you know, whatever, con whatever action that Congress takes, whether we're appropriating more funds to the Election Assistance Commission, whether we're continuing to plus up CISA, which we have done, <laughs> Uh, since Director Krebs left, um, and you know, or whether we are going to continue in our oversight capacity to investigate uh, what's even happened over the last six months um, and what we're seeing from at least open source news reports, even with the trucker convoy and the way that foreign actors have been amplifying um, some of the messages and almost even directing. I, I hate to use that. A word, but there's there seems to be really close coordination there that I think um, foreshadows what's to come. I think that there's a lot of room for oversight here that could be done, but if the American people still are not in a place to believe any of the facts as truth, then we're not making progress. And so it is my hope that uh, our colleagues in the executive branch will act with some you know, additional courage and assertiveness, right? And, and make sure that they're really leaning in because there are several of us in the Congress that are really um, looking forward to having their backs as they do this work with vigor. So you're obviously familiar with the, uh, the argument that uh, the rights to free speech inhibit uh, the government's ability to limit disinformation. I mean, can you legislate against the transmission of lies? Uh, it, it is not, that is not the point, in my opinion. The point is, is that we have disinformation spreading on privately held American companies, you know, platforms, um, where there is no free speech protection. There is no free speech right on Facebook. It is governed by community standards. Twitter has community standards, even, um, what is it, Parler and, you know, these other emerging platforms have some type of standard that is an agreement between users on how they'll use that platform. Um, and, you know, I think that these media companies have to be held accountable and there is room for regulating how they conduct business um, and how they profit on the demise of our democracy. That is absolutely fair play. And I think that, you know, we have a Congress where there may not be even still the sophistication among the members to, to explore all of the aspects, but there's plenty here for us to work on if 
it were made a priority. I think the current political environment makes it difficult, which is why I began my remarks talking about the executive branch acting with urgency, vigor, and assertiveness, um, because I think that they will have some success where we, quite frankly, may not in the Congress. Um, but this is not about the First Amendment. Chris, tell me, what would accountability look like mm. for the social media companies? What if you if you were king of the world and could just uh, ooh, draft the regulations or the laws? What, it doesn't sound very democratic. Yeah, but it's I'd sign up for it right now. But you know, it's a <laughs> it's a, it's, a, it's a special case. Uh, what would you have them do? So we actually took a look at this um, last year. The Aspen Institute. Uh, we it was the, really the first thing. One of the first things I did. Well, I guess it was the second thing after Solar Winds. But the second thing I did after government um, and was co-chair the Aspen Commission on Information Disorder with a number of uh, you know, Katie Couric was a co-chair, Rashad Robinson, a color of change, and we looked at many of the issues we've talked about. We really isolated down. What are the three primary areas of disinformation that we wanted to focus on? First was public health, COVID. Second was democracy. And third was uh, communities of color, as, as the Congresswoman talked about. And those were, I think, we isolated out the most crucial to at least the current fabric of society. As we, as we worked through it, there, from a, a set of recommendations, we focused on first, increasing transparency. Second was reducing um, uh, reducing harms and then increasing uh, you know, accountability and uh, in restoring, really restoring trust. Uh, so on the transparency side, the way that I've always likened this to is it's almost like we're in a post-Enron moment where there was a failure of disclosure, a failure of, it, that led to a breach of trust and, and the collapse of, of Enron and, and all the people that suffered as a result of that. We're almost in a similar lack of transparency state with the social media platforms. So the majority of our recommendations were focused on kind of that first step, not the second step of, actually regulating platforms and getting into any conversation about uh, moderating speech or touching on First Amendment issues, but instead just saying like, the, the social media platforms aren't doing the basics right now, aren't disclosing moderation policy, aren't retaining information and making it available for public and private researchers to, to see how moderation is going, to looking at the reach and the extent of super spreaders, to uh, look at advertising policies, which is actually one of the few areas I think right now Congress could take a look at, not broadly repealing Section 230, but some targeted amendments to Section 230, um, which, which, it, which it would exclude kind of product design and, and advertising algorithms. So it's just, it, you know, we start the accountability journey somewhere, and that has to be with just good old plain transparency from the platforms. So transparency was the first of your three uh, remedies. Well, uh, so in terms of reducing harms, I mean, this 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 goes to if you if we're constantly searching for government to be the solution to all of life's problems, then we're ultimately going to fail and always be disappointed. The government's just not geared for that. There's a broader role for society. So uh, Edel, Edelman has done research recently that continues to show that corporate leaders are the most trusted names and, and people in our society right now. And so we need more of corporate leaders standing up and saying this is not acceptable. And you're seeing that right now. You're seeing what Disney is talking about uh, with Florida and you see the reaction, you see the cancel culture conversation. But these things matter, there is an impact. Corporations can have, a, uh, have an impact here. We need, for instance, also uh, you know, self-policing across groups like lawyers. So state bar associations can take action against those that sponsor the 60 plus uh, frivolous lawsuits or whatever percentage of those that were frivolous. You can look at COVID, you can see state uh, medical boards similarly took action against uh, a number of uh, doctors that were grifting on various uh, uh, um, solutions to COVID. So we've got to have a much broader focus. But it's not just the platforms. It's not just um, it's not just the government. But there's also the rest of society that can weigh in. Yeah. Your your um, office has what more than 100 people in it? 165 full time. 3,000 during the general election season. Are you experiencing uh, what we read about in some other places where the where the amount of uh, Disinformation and harassment that comes from that 
uh, and intimidation that comes from that. Is that leading people to quit? No, I bring donuts regularly, so <laughs> they stay. No, uh, in all honesty, it, it is a documented phenomenon across elections departments in the United States. I'm incredibly blessed in that the vast majority of our team members have stayed strong, and not just stayed strong, but responded by doubling down on their work efforts, putting in long hours. And these are people who could, yes, be making more in the private sector, but these are people who are really committed to this process. It's such a blessing to work with them, um, and I, I'm just, I'm, I'm lucky. Um, but I do want to touch on Chris's point, if you don't mind. Please. So, yeah, I, I agree as far as, you know, I get, I'm a little more libertarian, well I am libertarian, and so I don't necessarily want to put the onus on social media companies because I think they have a right to regulate as private companies, but I do think that First Amendment jurisprudence might need to be reevaluated in Sullivan and its progeny if Dominion voting systems is not successful in its defamation lawsuits. Because I think this was just a poster example, poster child example of a company that was doing nothing wrong, was producing a good product that wasn't even engaging in the political sphere all that much, just for no reason, no fault of its own, got completely destroyed and a lot of their people got absolutely terrorized. And it was just, it, they knew from the get-go. I mean, there's memos from the Trump attorneys that say the Dominion claims are all bogus. And if they don't win, then I think we have a First Amendment jurisprudence problem. And I think Chris is also right that the, the bar associations, of which I'm a member, and I'm inactive, and I still pay $300 a month, or $300 a year. And it's like, what is that doing if the only lawyers that you're disciplining are the guy who's doing cocaine right in front of the judge? It's like, well done you, bar association. But if you're not going after these people who file these frivolous complaints with no factual basis, no investigation, if the only person that you're gonna take out of this is Rudy Giuliani and he lose, he gets his license suspended, then I would say you effectively do not have a regulated industry, and maybe that's a good thing. Again, back to a libertarian, but give me my $300 back at least. Sorry. <laughs> how do you measure, the point here is how do you measure the damage that's been done, right? Dominion's a great example, and I think it's fantastic that they're, they're pursuing their own uh, civil, you know, civil lawsuits against a number of different parties. But those cases are gonna take multiple years to resolve themselves. And, and, and John Poulos is not going to settle. He's gonna take this to the very, very bitter end. That is going to take years and years and years, and the damage is done. The company is losing, even in, in Arizona and Colorado. The, we have immense pressures not to use Dominion ever again. No, there, there are yeah. election officials that have said, we have to cancel our Dominion contracts in order to restore confidence in the local citizenry, the, the local voters. Based on nothing. So the damage is done. And so to your point about you know, rethinking First Amendment jurisprudence, I don't know what that looks like, but the system's broken at some point, in part because even in November and December, I guarantee you that courts would not have intervened because it was still a political matter and they wouldn't want to get in the middle of that until December 14th and the certification deadline. So I, I think there's something here that's not matching up, and I, you know, and I hope they win. I hope they get their billions and billions of dollars, and I hope they people, put people out of business or bankrupt them, but the damage has been done to the, the psyche of the voter, to hundreds of people that were, you know, had death threats, you know, Comer, I mean, it's, it's- But have you witnessed a chilling effect just by their fi filing of the lawsuits? Like, have you witnessed fewer people- Not on Mike Lindell, no. no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, not on Mike Lindell. Uh, yeah, I tried to interview him about something else recently, and I, I couldn't get one answer that wasn't about the Dominion voting machines. Uh, Congresswoman, I wanted to ask, I mean, Louis Brandeis had the famous uh, aphorism that the cure to wrong speech is more speech, that the marketplace of ideas will correct errors uh, and truth will win out. Is, is is the U.S. government doing enough to counter disinformation by putting out true information? Um, I think that <laughs> it is not for lack of trying. However, um, the U.S. government is playing a different game with different rules, with a different length of time. You know, like in basketball, right? There might be a length of time for NBA versus the final four that just passed. Listen, 
I don't know what analogy you want me to use, but it's completely, it's a different game. It is completely different. And when you have criminal actors who are seeking to harm the United States and our democracy and the targeting of different segments of American citizens through social media platforms, which is a fact, right? Influence behavior and harm to say that the government is not doing enough or is not able to counter that is, is maybe true. However, I, I can't think of a way for the government to be able to message people, whether it's a DM or a viral tweet or some kind of really compelling post that the algorithms would boost enough for, for people to see. I mean, it is just not the function of government. This is not what they do. And that is how this exploitation has happened. And so I think that this question is great in a theoretical sense, but this is happening to people on their phones and their devices every day. And the human being, right, the regular American consumer cannot tell the difference between a regular person that they might be casually viewing a post and a foreign bad actor who is seeking to influence the thinking, the behavior, or the direction of an election or some kind of other outcome here in this country. The average viewer, the average user, the average consumer cannot distinguish between the difference and the government cannot change the algorithm. And so a single post, a single press release, a single directive, memo, guidance document, whatever, speech from the president is never gonna be amplified to the same level as this other content. And so that is why it cannot just be government to take action if we are not willing to have a serious conversation about the role of the media platform and the media companies. Is because that- part of it is an, I mean, it is an algorithmic issue in addition to these foreign actors and domestic actors who are, who are creating and spreading and leveraging their ability to sow chaos in this country through disinformation. Is there a bill in Congress that could do something and it's being blocked? Being blocked? Well, I mean, that it just can't, that, that it, it can't, doesn't command enough votes to get through. Is there a bill that you think actually would help, uh, but it's going nowhere? Um, no, because listen, I was the chair when Chris Krabs was running CISA for several months, I was the chair of the authorizing subcommittee that had jurisdiction. Okay. And during that time, we could not even get testimony from the social media companies. They would not appear before the Congress. They wouldn't come. Okay. I'm a nurse. In nursing, what do we do first? We do an assessment. We don't run towards a solution. We cannot even do an assessment (laughs) leveraging our tools because these people will not come and testify, okay? And so I guess what I'm saying is that you are looking at um, this as if there is just one solution. I think that there are multiple solutions. We can have the conversation about money and politics. I think we need to pass the For the People Act. Um, You know, I think that there are things that could help, but is there one bill that solves this problem? Absolutely not. So let, let's talk, we're, we're in Chicago, let's talk about market solutions. Uh, it was pointed out in the last panel that uh, some people make a lot of money from disinformation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I wonder, Chris, if you could see a way of, of demonetizing so the way I see it, and I think this has been for you know human history, and the joke I've told before, and I'm sure Joan Donovan will cringe because I've told this, but um, disinformation is the third oldest profession in human history. Intelligence collection being number two. We all know what number one is. <laughs> and they're all probably linked in some way, but look, I mean, propaganda, whatever you want to call it, has been around trying to, you know, power structures trying to influence outcomes to their benefit has always just been the way of the world. Ever since, maybe even preceding, a common language was established. 
And so we, what we're looking at now into your market solutions, we can do everything we want on the supply side. We can regulate platforms six ways to Sunday. We can have the intelligence community burning down every internet rate research equivalent you know, spinoff uh, from Russia and elsewhere. The issue though is we're still going to have demand. And the demand side and just the, the need for alternative theories is always going to, to be present. And so there is opportunity, I think, for government, for civil society, for NGOs to continue to push out information that provides a, a, you know, a baseline of understanding of what's going on. So for elections, for instance, the average person does not know how elections work. They think, at least in states where there's not 80% mail-in voting like Arizona, that you show up on the day of the election, you vote, then you flip on Fox or CNN or whatever that night to see who won. And obviously they're months before and they're months after. So we've got to do a better job for elections, just elections alone, more civic education, more engagement. To, to your broader point of, of how do you demonetize that, well, I think that's part of the problem right now with social media companies, it, particularly with Section 230 protections, is the way it was established was in you know, the Web 1.0 era before Web 2.0, where it actually became about advertisements. And so what does that next generation look like? How do we incentivize more social media platforms that are optimized for engagement that is not dependent upon clicks and, and, and people paying uh, per click? And there are some initiatives uh, that, are, that are working on that. I was, again, a, a member of the Commission on Information Disorder at Aspen. Deb Roy has been doing some, some pilots here in, in the Chicago area about more community level engagement that's not dependent upon a corporate click through. Which is not I, at all I, a satisfying oh. answer for you, and I get that. Can I just comment that, you know, Director Krebs, he definitely knows this, but I think we should be very clear that there is a difference between disinformation and propaganda. How would you define that? I mean, propaganda is not, propaganda is generally coming from someone with power seeking to influence a political decision. That's how I define it. Disinformation is somebody putting out information to cause harm. And that is much more broad than a political conversation. It, so it's funny, I, I, and I, I don't generally disagree. I think there's some, the, the problem we have right now is one of taxonomy and lexicon. And so the broader, I think, uh, Claire Wardle has established this, this concept of, of this is all just within the, the broader architecture of information disorder and how, you know, whether it's misinformation, which is fake inform, you know, false information that you don't know is inaccurate and you're, you're not pushing it to hurt anybody. And as the Congresswoman said, disinformation is when an actor pushes fake information with intent to harm. And then you have malinformation, which has been more along the lines of the hack and leak campaigns where you're, you're releasing real information to harm uh, people. But there's a, a much broader set of activities. But again, this is, tends to be, and I like the, the fact that you mentioned power, as I've seen it, the power structures, it's about power, influence, and money. Every single major, you know, whether it's a, a disinfo campaign around COVID or elections or whatever, there's been one of those three or two or three in play. Even the COVID fraudsters that were grifting, it was about money. They were pushing alternative remedies for money. Even I think former President Trump, it's, a com it's, a, it's probably all three. Fundraising to fill the war chest, maintain influence over his followers, and reclaim the presidency. You fit in that, that that you fit in that framework somewhere. Yeah, the uh, the other side hasn't been profitable for me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no. I, to the to the free market solution idea, I think that uh, a good barometer will actually be Barack Obama. You see what I did there, Barama, barometer. Yeah. <laughs> okay, not so much, um, because President Obama framed him, cast himself yesterday as a free speech absolutist in the fashion of Brandeis, and he's somebody who also has experience in the startup world. And so, you know, bring him back in a year, invite me back as well, and see if he thinks that the, the market has started coming up or if that has chipped away at his competitive marketplace of ideas. You know, does he think 
and will he continue to think a year from now that people want to consume the truth such that some of these innovative tech companies can maybe just get better at identifying the truth and that's where we're all rushed to? Or was Brandeis wrong? Was I wrong? Was President Obama wrong that the marketplace is completely broken and people are maybe even more interested in, in consuming non-truths than truths? I, I don't know if it's, I wouldn't say it's broken. I think it, so OAN is a great example. DirecTV dropping OAN, they reconfirmed that this week. I mean, I personally canceled DirecTV because of their sponsorship initially of OAN and their continued. So now, you know, I'm on the streaming. I finally cut the cord, but the point is, particularly on the edges, I think there's opportunity where the market can sort itself out. It's at the core, the established networks. I don't, I don't know if, if that's gonna work, but the biggest issue is I see it, and it's not necessarily a good or a bad thing, is it, it just still takes too damn long to the yeah. Dominion case. It just takes a really long time. And then how do you measure the harm and the impacts done with a longer tail? Yeah, short-term, long-term problem. Uh, I wanna invite all you folks to uh, get into the conversation. Uh, I'll still answer or ask a question or two myself, but uh, why don't we uh, start in the front row? Say your name and ask your question. Who wants to take that? I mean, I try not to think about them or talk about them ever, uh, but it's, it's, it is hard. I mean, I, I, I was a firm believer after I was uh, let go from my position that he had the ability and the influence to put everything to bed, to put it all to bed. That in you know, early December, he could have said, you know what, I lost fair and fair. He could have con continued that 253 uh, year uh, tradition of the, the peaceful transfer of power, but it wasn't in his interest of power, influence, or money. It, January 6th could have been prevented. Everything to the state, he's still, even, yes, Josh Dawsey from the Washington Post did a great interview with him yesterday, had a piece this morning. He is still hung up on it, and whether he truly believes it or not, I don't know, but, but I do see him as being, you know, at the, as one of the most responsible people for um, the, where we are right now, but here's the problem. He could go away tomorrow, and I think the way the permission structures have been set is that he's activated this larger piece where I do think a significant portion of the Republic, Republican Party is moving orthogonal to democracy, and I don't know how you bring that back. I'm a Republican. What? <laughs> Yes. The currently serving Republican, <laughs> right. Hello, my name is Cameron. Um, Chris, you mentioned the broader role for society. Um, one organization that comes to mind is the Stanford Internet Observatory. Um, and I recognize that this is a university-based organization, but I'm wondering what you think about the viability of organizations like that in civil society, working with journalists to help field some of this stuff. And when I say this stuff, I mean disinformation, uh, some of the general problems around how do we communicate in a democracy, et cetera. Uh, so just for full transparency, my um, business partner, Alex Stamos, in the Krebs Stamos group, my business partner runs the Stanford uh, Internet Observatory. So um, it's I've, the best. <laughs> I've got a certain perspective. Look, I, they were responsible uh, working with a number of other organizations, uh, Harvard, University of Washington, another um, uh, another uh, number of other schools for the uh, the EIP. Which I always get this wrong exactly what it's the election integrity, but then there's a, the P is what I sometimes mess up, whether it's project or partnership, because one EIP is not good, the other one is, is good. 
But um, I, I think there is a role where you can pull teams together and you can analyze information uh, in real time and then they can you know, sort out and push out uh, you know, authoritative, credible uh, information to, to correct the record. But, but the bigger point here is that every one of these disinformation campaigns, you know, the, the flood the zone with S, is, as Stephen said, um, I, I don't necessarily agree with Brandeis on this. I, I don't think that you can overcome when the entire strategy is not to convince someone of a single outcome or a single issue, but instead it's to completely collapse the concept of truth, to confuse, to, to have people doubt what is real anyway, you're not going to correct the record with facts. You're not going to fix it. I think they're in, in specific anticipated areas where you have time to plan, uh, equip, train, and deploy. Um, they are useful. But, but the longer term strategy for countering disinformation, I, I just do not think that, that a point by point rebuttal is, is it, it's just not economic. We have time for just uh, one more question. Yeah. I think and this is Jonathan Weiss from the New York Times. Um, this is mostly for Representative Underwood, but anyone who wants to jump in. We talked about, you talked about some of the past issues, obviously 2016 disinformation, disinformation around COVID. But I'm wondering if you see anything going on right now, um, subject matter or a actual campaigns that are developing, maybe developing toward the 20, uh, 2022 elections uh, that you're watching and that we as consumers should also be watching? Um, I'm personally very concerned about what happens in Ukraine and if there's a cyber attack and a um, related disinformation campaign, how the American consumer responds. Um, that is a real threat to our national and economic security as a nation. And that is a big problem uh, that we are not socialized yet to anticipate and respond, um, recognizing that that is how modern warfare could be conducted. Um, and that could happen in conjunction with an election, um, or it could happen at any moment in time, and it could be catastrophic. I wanna take it a little closer to home because he texted me, and we were talking about this before this panel, but if Brad Raffensperger wins in Georgia, I think that's a huge win for democracy in the United States. But right. the bigger point here, though, is the Secretary of State races in 22 are gonna determine in Arizona, Colorado, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and elsewhere, they're gonna be the ones to decide in many of those cases, the certification of the results. In, in the Didn't the Atlantic write democracy is on the ballot or something? Wasn't that an article yeah. headline? For, for 2024, for <laughs> the next presidential. So Secretary of State races, uh, keep an eye on those. I'm sorry to say we're out of time. Uh, please, uh, thank you for coming in, and please join me in thanking, uh, yeah. <laughs> there is absolutely a director's privilege. You're supposed to get a mic though. Sorry about that. Um, uh, and I want to address all, uh, this question to all of you, and it's going to be an, ob an obvious question, but we can get lost in the details and kind of lose the forest for the trees. What does it mean for a democracy if uh, large numbers of people uh, begin to doubt or, or, or do doubt the legitimacy of elections? Congresswoman, would you like to start? What happens? I mean, then we don't have a strong functional democracy. Well, if the doubt leads to not voting, if the doubt leads to a repeat of January 6th and it is successful, there, our democracy collapses. Um, the, the doubt has to, um, I believe, lead to behavior change for there to be a collapse in our democracy because the doubt is already widespread and yet our democracy has endured. It is still very fragile <laughs> and very weak. Um, and I agree with the panelists that um, the, the upcoming election will set us on a course 
Um, I don't necessarily endorse a specific candidate as the uh, determine <laughs> the determining uh, feature um, of that. But I think that you know we need to do all that we can to continue to instill confidence in the American people. So Bart's done some very good reporting on the uh, January 6th insurrection. Many of those people uh, believed that they were acting as patriots uh, because that the election was illegitimate and they were protecting the country uh, from that. It seems, you know, I, I'm only underscoring this to say that's why this particular group is so profoundly important, this, this discussion, uh, because if people lose faith in the legitimacy uh, of, uh, yeah. of, the, of, the elect, of elected officials, then it justifies almost anything. Well, at least that's a logical syllogism that we can follow, because if you believe that the process is being stolen from you, then that justifies extreme measures. Jonathan Rausch, who's a senior fellow at Brookings Institute, I think wrote the most important book maybe in the last year, which was The Constitution of Knowledge. And he reminded me that you know, 10 to 20 percent of Americans actually read the horoscope and think that determines their day. So it's not that people have illogical thought processes. It's just that when they band together through new social media channels and they get militant about it and they become impervious to any sort of rationale outside of that social structure, that it becomes and it, something really malign and manifests with January 6th or with other less heralded attempts to thwart democracy. I, so, I, look, I mean, what you're describing doesn't sound a whole lot like a democracy to me, right? And, and I think to have a democracy, you've got to have, you've got to want to be it. You have to actually invest in it. You have to put the effort in. You know, when you have a party that seems to, again, be moving orthogonal to democracy, it seems to be a pretty significant uh, threat to, you know, we used to joke that, you know, what's the point of an election if to convince the loser they lost? Can the loser be convinced? Bart, you should comment on this because you, you have done spectacular reporting on this. It's very bleak, though. Exactly, it's very <laughs> bleak. It's, uh, you know, it, I, I'm, I'm not all about the uplift. I, I think if people lose faith in elections, uh, that they're losing faith in the system that we invented uh, to replace uh, violence for deciding who has power. I mean, it used to be, War would make that decision, uh, you know, one tribe versus another. We agreed to a set of rules and to votes and to neutral vote counters. And if you don't believe that apparatus is legitimate, uh, then then you then you open the door to uh, political violence on a larger scale. Okay, I got on the record what I wanted. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming, and please thank the panelists. Thank you.